Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are the light of the world. You have shown on us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and in him we find the light of life. Help us always to cling to this light for the truth and for our salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are plenty reasons for us to feel as if we are people walking in the darkness. This is one of those dark times of the year. Yes, December 21st was the shortest amount of daylight, but in these winter days in January, when there's no more holiday lights, no more holiday cheer, when the Christmas bills are coming due, when the weather is cloudy and heavy, when there's the gloom and doom of ice storms, the moods of most people kind of match the weather, and we feel bleak and dreary. The world is a dark place as well. A nuclear Iran and North Korea, cyber attacks, identity thefts, random acts of terrorism even here in the United States, personal security about the future with our jobs, relationships, health, retirement. It feels as if we live in one of those lines out of the first Noel. A cold winter's night that was so deep. Deep darkness. Someone once said that if you're experiencing darkness, you should pray to God to uh, set you free from it. And if you're still experiencing darkness, then maybe you should pay your electric bill. <laughs> but let's get a real perspective here. I mean, we're not the first people who feel like we live in the land of darkness. The people of Israel in our Old Testament lesson 700 years ago felt like they lived in a land of darkness as well. There was a coalition that had formed between their brothers to the north, the nation of Israel and the nation of Syria. They had ganged up together to besiege and attack Jerusalem and the country of Judah. Surely the king and the people had prayed for God to deliver them, but it seemed that God was silent to them. The siege of the Jerusalem left the people distressed and hungry. Isaiah says that they were in gloom and darkness, in distress and anguish, as if they had been thrust into thick darkness. And we know how that feels. The threat of global terrorism keeps us on edge and anxious. Economic insecurity leaves us feeling empty. Health care costs and cyber attacks create anxiety and anguish. And in looking in the future, we may feel that we ourselves are being thrust into thick darkness. Darkness, deep darkness, thick darkness. We need illumination. Now the people of Israel saw a ray of hope in the promise that Isaiah gave them of the birth of a new king. A king who would be a descendant of David. In verse 7 of chapter 9 of Isaiah, the, where our text came from, he said, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He said authority would rest upon his shoulders, that his name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there would be no end. Those are the same words that we heard just three weeks ago. But with the grind of daily life, the darkness of winter and its dreariness, those words now seem but a distant memory. 
This child, though, this king was to be the hope of Israel, the one who would bring them light in their darkness, who would rule them with justice and righteousness. This child king was to be their future hope. Quite often, we as people, in the midst of the distress of life, the turmoils of life, often place a lot of hope in children as well. Sort of anointing them as the future hope of the nation or of our communities. And sometimes children don't disappoint. An 18-year-old named Taylor Wilson decided you know, I'm going to build a new, safer, more effective nuclear reactor. And he did. A 17-year-old Kenyan named Richard Torreira was afraid that lions were going to attack his family's livestock. So he built a, an automated security system. A 16-year-old named Jack Andraka became angry at pancreatic cancer because it took one of his family's friends and instead of cursing the darkness, he lit a candle. He, against conventional wisdom, developed a protein-based blood test for this cancer that was faster, more effective, and cheaper than any of the options available at the time. And he did this, it was said, while dealing with homework, parents, and puberty. Seeing children do such great things is enough to give you future hope. Sometimes we anoint children as our future hope. The season of epiphany that we are in now is really also a season about future hope. The season of epiphany is focused on Jesus making himself known as God in the flesh. God made manifest. All the scripture readings indicate to us and illustrate how Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation for the world. He is the one who had been promised for millennia, promised way before the time of Isaiah. Jesus is the Savior that God had sent according to plan, according to the way it had been revealed in Scripture from ancient times. Jesus was the future hope that has become a reality. So if we're talking about young innovators, the most impressive of God's young innovators was born in Bethlehem about 700 years after the prophet Isaiah. Think about that though. Think about that for the people of Israel living in that darkness of the time with the threat of, ta of attack on them. The promise that they would be delivered wasn't immediate. It came 700 years later. It would be like us waiting till the 28th century for the Savior to arrive. No doubt they had hoped that their future hope would have come a lot sooner. But come, he did. Isaiah predicted his coming and the Virgin Mary brought him into the world. Jesus was born to show us God's love and to save us from our sins. In the middle of a dark, dark night, he came to us, bringing us the light of hope, our future hope. He is our future hope, not because he is a child, but because he is Jesus. So Isaiah was right 700 years earlier when he said that there would be a continual increase in the authority of this Savior. We see it in the world today. The authority of Jesus 
only continues to be increased and grow with about 2 billion Christians in our world today, about a third of the world's global population. Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would enlighten his people beginning in the land of Naphtali and Zebulun as it says in, the, in our text. And in the gospel lesson we find Jesus beginning to reveal the coming of the kingdom of God. Where at? In Capernaum. There on the border of Zebulun and Naphtali. Bringing light to those living in the land of darkness. He teaches them. He heals them. He calls them to follow him. And Jesus continues to offer us his light in this challenging and contentious world. Saying to us, I am the light of the world. Those, whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus promises that no matter how culture or society may try to darken the truth of his word, those who follow him will always have the light of truth to measure things. No matter how much those who self-proclaim themselves as the cultural elite try to bully Christians, we always have the truth of light, of God's light before us in Jesus Christ. But notice that Jesus never promises us an escape. He promises us to give us light in the midst of those challenging times. Jesus calls in the gospel the people to come to repentance for the kingdom of God is near. A kingdom marked, as Isaiah says, with justice and righteousness from this time onward and even forevermore. He wants justice for God's people, rich and poor, black and white, conservative and liberal, immigrant and native-born. He is focused on people, bringing people into a right relationship with God and with one another. That's the root meaning of righteousness, being in a right relationship, not by following a set of laws or regulations, but by being in just, giving, loving, committed relationships, just like the relationship Jesus has with each of us, brightening our lives with forgiveness and love. Our hope for the future is found in Jesus. Jesus brings light to the world. He is the one who establishes justice and righteousness. Isaiah says, view yourselves as people who have been walking in darkness, but now have seen a great light. See yourselves as fellow pilgrims with those of the land of Judah. Our advantage, of course, is one of history. Because we know and we have seen the divine light that Jesus is that brightens our life with forgiveness and love. Epiphany is the time of future hope where the bright morning star of Christ sheds his light into the darkness of this world. The birth of Jesus reminds us that children can make a difference, whether it be making a, designing a safer nuclear reactor or developing a better blood test or being the savior of the world. The morning star has come in the person of Jesus. To those living in the land of darkness, a light has shined on us. 
He makes, he enters the lives of each of us today to show us God's love, to save us from our sins, to lead us in paths of righteousness. Receive the light. Embrace the light. Share the light. Resolve to let the light of God shine in the dark places that you find in the world. Take actions that establish justice and righteousness for the world. Actions that help people build right relationships between people and God and with one another. As the saying goes, instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. Jesus is the light that gives us future hope. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.